my personal journey, I felt life time and time and again forces you to navigate through your personal ideological goals and path you choose to achieve them. I had experienced weakness and lack of power early on in my life. Hence, I wanted to be powerful, strong, and successful. Let me explain. While growing up, my father used to tell us stories of him going to swim in a village river. That made me want to learn how to swim. I started going to an hour-long class right after school. While I loved to swim, I was wary of the coach. I had seen him act inappropriately before. He would make comments at our swimsuit and make passes at us. But this was something which was really not talked about. He had tried to grab me a few times, but I managed to escape. One day, when he decided to come inside the pool to teach us new techniques, I saw him touch inappropriately a girl in our class. I saw it, but I did not know what to do. All I could get myself to do that day was sit next to her quietly to comfort her. There was really no space within the community or in my family to talk, to talk about these issues. So even if it bothered me a lot, I kept it to myself. And somehow, keeping it to myself made me feel like it never happened and made it easier to move on, or so that I thought. A few years later, the memory came back to haunt me at a maths tuition class. It was raining that day, hence very few students had showed up for the class. Teacher gave us few problems to solve. Being an enthusiastic student, I finished it first. And as I turned around, I saw teacher standing to a, a girl in my class. He must have thought nobody was looking, and he grabbed her breast. I was right there, but again, I did not know what to do. I thought to myself, should I get up and scream? Should I get up and leave? Or should I just look the other way? I decided to look the other way while somebody was being abused in my presence. I went home that day with my head hanging down, and all I could think about is how unjust, unfair this world was. I had to share this with someone, hoping that it would make even a small difference. I told it to my mother, but she instantly brushed it under the rug. In defiance, I stopped going to the maths class. And I had to promise myself that never, ever again I will get caught up in dilemmas whether to act or not in situations which warranted action. I had to become strong, powerful, to ensure that I stand up for justice. These instances of abuse eventually faded in my memory, but they did leave a scar. And I can say it with certainty that almost all of us have had such experiences. The gravity may differ, but all of us have been made to confront our dilemmas. Maybe you had come across someone lying on the street after an accident, and while you're driving past them, you thought to yourself, maybe I should stop. Maybe to satisfy the dilemma, you thought that, oh, someone, will, someone else will stop to help. We are not only quick to brush aside the feeling of failure to other human beings, but we come up with clever arguments to justify our inaction. Who would have dealt with the police? Who would have gone to court to testify? Oh, I was already running late. Instances like this warrant at least a reflection, if not reaction. These are genuine concerns, but they are defining moments in our making. And we have to ask ourselves a question as to how long can we afford to be indifferent while the world falls apart in front of our eyes. While I was grappling with these life questions and ignored maths, I failed my exams. Not once, not twice, but three times. 
While I had failed my family's expectations, the thought of failing my own expectations again made it unbearable. What chance was there for me becoming anything, anyone, let alone strong, powerful and successful? Little did I know there was an opportunity in this failure too. Now that the expectations were all time low from me, I was free to decide for myself. I could have become a mountaineer, seeker, healer, traveler, but of all things I decided to become a human rights lawyer. I know being a lawyer might sound mundane, but if you think of it, law is a very powerful tool in the democracy. And a lawyer is a powerful medium through which justice is ensured to be delivered. And a compassionate lawyer can be instrumental to bring about positive change, not only inside, but outside the courtrooms. With a lawyer's assistance, court can uphold rights of hundreds of people and hold abusers to accountability. If you think of it, court has made several interventions on behalf of citizens of this country. Right to safe motherhood, right to livelihood, right to food, right to privacy. To give you an example, in 2009, 26 families from indigenous communities were illegally evicted by the government. These families were staying in central Delhi for about 70 years. With utter disregard to human life, these families were evicted to build an underpass between two sports stadiums, just so that the athletes could move conveniently. A woman who used to drive past the slums every day to drop her kids to school noticed people being evicted and she decided to do something. She contacted us and I, along with my colleagues, filed a petition before the Delhi High Court. In a landmark decision, the Delhi High Court recognized my client's right to housing. The court directed the government to provide meaningful rehabilitation to the evictees within four months. Meaningful rehabilitation would mean that the communities is not pushed to the edges of the city and left to fend for themselves, but to have the conversation with them. This decision not only helped lawyers across India to stop number of other illegal evictions, but was also noted in number of national and international journals. I could say proudly that this was the case I worked on. But six months later, I came across the client from the same case, begging on the street. And that failed, felt my heart with sense of failure as the most celebrated decision on the housing rights was reduced to mere an intellectual victory. There are several such instances where the court decisions have failed to trickle down to people and has failed to become reality. Yes, law is powerful and lawyers hold the key to that power because they know how to interpret, simplify, and apply the law. But when we fail to transfer that power, that knowledge to people, the very system built to protect and safeguard rights of the people becomes exploitative. Courts are often inaccessible to people who need this protection the most. People find its grandiose structure, elite language, complicated procedure, and dearth of empathy unnerving. Even in, in spite of all odds, if people get a favorable decision, its non-implementation be becomes the entire process futile. In spite of being a largest democracy, why are we failing to protect marginalized and vulnerable? Why are we further victimizing the victim? And why are our biases against minority becoming even more stronger? 
I found myself grappling with these fundamental questions again. But one thing I knew, that the top-down approach I was using was not working. Was not working for me, was not working for my clients. And I re realized it was because that people do not possess the agency to put these decisions to use, these victories to use. And I found this as a major gap in my work and a roadblock in access to delivering of justice. I knew something that I wanted to be the medium through which the information flows and not be a barrier. Sure, it was going to be difficult, but when I met two inspiring women who were also facing similar dilemmas in their work, the journey became a little easier. We realized that the meaningful, meaningful, sustainable change could only come about from ground up. That would mean sharing information with communities on their rights and entitlements and sharing the knowledge to hold government accountable for failure in delivering those. Based on this premise in 2013, we co-founded Nazdeek and we have successfully fused grassroots legal education, monitoring and advocacy to bring access to justice closer to marginalized in Delhi and Assam. Assam, a state which ensures that we have our cup of chai, is also a state where tea plantation workers are living in abject poverty. It's also the state where most women die during childbirth due to anemia and lack of services. With a vision to bring about change, we had decided to train women living in this context to share the knowledge of laws and entitlements which, are, which government is supposed to provide them and the knowledge to hold them accountable. I had seen empowerment in action. In, during one of our trainings, we had shared a phone number. And the women who we were training had used that number and the rights-based language to file several complaints on the issues which they were grappling with. Seeing the positive outcome, they decided to share this number with hundreds of tea plantation workers and knowledge how to file complaints for better delivery of services within their community. It amazed me to see how the sharing of one phone number and to fuse it with rights language gave this largely illiterate and disempowered community an avenue to demand, demand accountability. Experiences like this made me realize how important for skilled professional is to work from the bottom up. How important it is for lawyers, doctors, engineers, architects, researchers, to contribute in work from bottom up. But I have seen this happen very rarely. And that got me thinking, why, why was it like that? Maybe our families, our society, and even our education system has over the time narrowed the scope of word success. Before we know it, we are pushed into lucrative Spaces, we like it or not. And we get caught up in, in the rut of it and we forget to pause, to think, to question. To give you an example, law schools uh, requires their first year interns to go and work with NGOs. And as they mature in their thinking, in their studies, their options trickle down to intern with a corporate firm. Legal aid clinics are either non-existent or defunct in most of these institutes. Why is the option of working on the social justice issues has been systematically taken away? 
Why are the students given an illusion of choice at the critical stages of this career? And when did this shift in our thinking happen? And did that shift happen naturally? Or we have been fed day in and day out? We need to reclaim the space. We need to reclaim the space to define success for ourselves and not being bullied by the rhetoric which has been fed to us our entire lives. I'm here to put that option back of working with people on the table as that matters the most. I wanted to be successful, powerful and strong. But meaning of these words have changed for me over the time. Power do not mean to me to have several people at my beck and my call. But it means to stand up with them at the time of the need. Strength do not mean that I monopolize knowledge, but it means to share and to build collaborations. And success means to be able to give back, to contribute in building ground up empowerment. I did not do anything which was conventionally considered successful. But I find myself happy, strong, and powerful. And I wonder, how would you define success for yourself? And how consciously would you do that?